what's up everyone, Rafal here from OPT and we are out in the mountains about an hour away from downtown LA so that we can have some darker skies because in this video we are going to be going over a unique form of astrophotography, star trails. But before we get into any of that, if you guys are enjoying the content and don't want to miss out on the Astro tutorials, gear reviews, and OPT announcements, go ahead and just destroy that like button because it really lets us know that you guys are enjoying the content. And don't forget to hit subscribe and ring the bell for notifications because we have videos coming out every week and we want you guys to be the best astronomers you can be. Now for the longest time I thought that star trails were just some fancy form of photo manipulation but then I learned that it's actually happening in real life and it can be done in camera. Now depending on where you point your camera in the sky you're going to get different results from your trails. For example, if you have Polaris in your shot, you're going to get more of that spiral look, but if you point away from Polaris, then you're going to get more of this wavy meteor shower kind of look. Now for those just getting into astrophotography, Polaris is more commonly known as the North Star and it is right next to the North Celestial Pole, which means it is the only star in the sky that doesn't move. That's not true. Okay, it moves a teeny bit, but not enough to be noticeable. Every other star travels across the sky as the Earth rotates, which is how you're able to get those awesome trails when you take long exposures with your camera. Star trails can be pretty by themselves, but they are incredibly beautiful when combined with gorgeous landscapes. Which is why we chose Vasquez Rocks for this video because of this beautiful formation behind me. Okay, so what do you need to start shooting star trails? Four things, a sturdy tripod, a camera that can shoot long exposures, preferably a wide angle lens, and some pre-planning comes in handy as well. A huge thing about star trails is that once you start shooting, any hiccups in weather, like clouds or fog, can ruin your night of imaging. A good app to use is something like Clear Outside, which tells you what kind of cloud coverage to expect and what phase the moon is in. We'll also leave some links to other great weather tracking programs and websites in the description below for you to check out. The moon phase is also very important for your shots. A full moon will make your shot look like it was taken during the daytime if your exposure is long enough, and a new moon can make your foreground look pitch black with no details. I personally like shooting with a moon that's 20 to 40% illuminated, but this is all based on preference and you can just experiment for yourself to see what works best for you. Planning is the first thing to make or break a good night of imaging. Now, talking about gear, you generally want any camera that could take long exposures, so pretty much any DSLR or mirrorless camera will work. If your camera does not have a built-in time-lapse feature, you'll also want to get an intervalometer. For lenses, you generally want a wider focal length, somewhere like 14 to 24 millimeters, and you also want a nice open aperture like f1.8 or 2.8. If your lens doesn't open that wide, don't worry, just shoot as wide as you can. Finally, you want a nice sturdy tripod that won't move once you start your imaging. We're going to be using our Radian carbon fiber tripod, and since we're shooting in the dirt, we've replaced the rubber feet with the included spikes for more security. Once we start shooting, we can't have any movement on the camera or on the tripod, so we're going to add an extra layer of security by hanging some weight on the bottom of the tripod. All right, so it's finally dark enough for us to start imaging, and I have my setup right here. As I mentioned earlier, you generally want a wider lens when shooting star trails if you're incorporating a nice landscape. So here I have a Rokinon 14mm f2.8 lens, and we'll be using it with this Canon 60D. Now, according to the 500 rule, because we're shooting on a 14mm, we can shoot our exposures up to 22 seconds before we start to get star trails. Now, in this case, it's perfectly okay to go longer because star trails are what we are trying to achieve anyway. That being said, you could shoot all in one exposure, but the thing about shooting in one long exposure is that it could take an hour or more to get a nice shot. That means you're running electricity through your sensor for over an hour. Your sensor will heat up and you'll introduce more noise and hot pixels into your image, which you'll need to edit out with dark frames or in Photoshop using the patch tool. Also, if you're doing one long exposure, every plane, ISS, Firefly that travels across your shot will be recorded in that one frame. And let's say you're an hour into the exposure and something happens, your battery shuts off, someone turns on a light, or your tripod moves, then you just lost an hour of time. So it's best to just take multiple shots, and if anything happens, you could just remove that one shot and fix the minor gaps later. Focusing is pretty simple. Basically, you just want to get the star as small as possible. If it starts to bloat, that means you're losing focus. A little bit of fine tuning will get you right where you need to be. So what I like to do is first make sure that the focus on your lens is set to manual and then use a digital zoom to punch in on a bright star or planet and just move the focus ring until your star is as small as it can be. To help set up your composition, you could bring your ISO much higher than normal and take a quick photo to see what your framing looks like. Yes, your image will look completely noisy, but this is just to get your composition right. Once you're ready to start shooting, you could bring your ISO down again. So before I set up my time lapse, I want our composition to look good. So I'm going to make sure that the aperture is completely open and set our shutter speed to 30 seconds because we're on a 14 millimeter lens and take a test shot. Okay, it's not bad, but I want my stars to be a little brighter. So I'm going to set my ISO up to 
3,800. You generally wanna keep your ISO below 3,200. Usually between 400 and 800 is the sweet spot. But this will change depending on your camera, the moon phase, light pollution, and the environment. Shooting with a lower ISO and a more closed aperture will give you slightly sharper stars with more star color. But like everything in photography, adjusting your settings will always have a trade-off. In this case, it'll be losing the details in our foreground. So I'm gonna keep my camera at 800 ISO. Okay, one more test shot. And I'm pretty happy with that. So our exposure is set to 30 seconds, f2.8 and ISO 800. The last thing we're gonna do is set up our time-lapse. Now, whether you have a built-in time-lapse feature or you're using an intervalometer, the steps are the same. I'm gonna tell my camera to take a photo every 31 seconds. And the reason why I'm doing 31 is because I want to give the camera enough time to finish writing the data onto the card before it starts to take a new image. If your images are taken too close together, then you run the risk of hitting the buffer, which is when your camera can't take another photo until it's finished writing the previous one onto the card. So one second is long enough for the camera to finish writing the image before taking the next one and avoid creating gaps in our star trails. Hitting the buffer is unlikely because cameras are able to take multiple images before even stopping, but this is something to be aware of. One last thing, make sure your camera's long exposure noise reduction is turned off. Some cameras have this feature, but it eats up a ton of time and we don't want that. It's usually labeled as long exposure or shutter NR. Great, so we're all set up. Now it's time to let the camera run, kick back and enjoy the stars. So once you dump all your images into your computer, you can use a program like Lightroom to make any minor adjustments you want before you start stacking. So this is what the image looked like out of camera. I made some minor adjustments just to help bring out the rocks and the stars a little bit. So once I'm happy with my settings, I'm going to select all my images, all 360 of them, go up to file and hit export. Now you could stack all your images in Lightroom if you want, but there are a couple of apps out there that do it for you as well. One of those being Star Stacks, which is the one we're gonna be using in this video. If you don't have Star Stacks, don't worry, there's a link in the description below for you to download it. Okay guys, so here we are in Star Stacks, and what you're going to do is click on this button right here to open up your images, go to the folder where all your images are, and then just hit Command or Control A to select all of them. All your images are gonna line up right down here, and if you took any dark frames while you were imaging, you would click this button right next to the Open Images folder and import the dark frames that you took. We didn't take any dark frames for this session, so we're gonna skip that. We're going to make sure that our blending mode is set to gap filling. And once everything is set in, we're gonna hit start processing and watch the magic happen. And if you guys did take any dark frames, you would hit subtract dark frames before you start processing. So that way the dark frames are actually subtracted from your images. And right here we have our stacked image. Now we're not done yet, we're almost there. The one thing we're going to do is under the gap filling tab, we're gonna click show threshold overlay. And that's going to give this green cast over the entire image. What we're gonna do is bring the threshold all the way down so that way the entire image is green and then we're just gonna slowly bring it up until the stars are mainly covered in green. We only want the stars covered in green because this is gonna tell the program what gaps to fill. If you're closer to a city and there's some light pollution being cast from the horizon, chances are you won't be able to get rid of that green overlay, but just try your best to make sure that only the stars are covered in green. So once you're happy with that, we could uncheck this and zoom in just a little bit to see what this is doing. And if I bring the amount all the way down, you can sort of see how the gap filling is working. So as I slowly start to bring this up, you can see that it's gonna start smoothing out those stars, especially here. You don't wanna do it too much because you're gonna do some crazy artifacting and it's going to blow out some of your stars. So you wanna find a happy medium so that way you don't have those gaps, you don't have that little jitter for every frame that was taken and you have a nice smooth star trail. The last thing we're going to do is come right up here and save our image. And this is what the result looks like. Now, because we didn't take any dark frames, we do have some hot pixels around the image. So there's one extra step you can take to clean that up. And I'm gonna show you how to do it in Photoshop. So I have my image opened up and I'm going to zoom in right here so you can see all these hot pixels. And then I'm just gonna to go to filter, noise, dust and scratches and watch what happens. It just completely disappears. Now for these pixels, you want the lowest setting so that way they don't affect the image too much. So I'm gonna set my radius to one and I'm going to bring my threshold up to about 10 so that way I retain some of that natural noise and the detail in the rocks. And then I'm gonna hit okay. And if I come up here and I toggle this back and forth, you can kind of see what that filter is doing. And like I said, this is just an extra step to help clean up any of those hot pixels that you may have picked up during your imaging. 
Star trails are an excellent way to get into astrophotography and once you start developing your skills, you can create some incredibly amazing images. If you enjoyed this video, go ahead and just smash that like button and make sure you subscribe and ring the bell for notifications because we have videos coming out every week and we want you guys to be the best astronomers you can be. Also, if you have any questions, go ahead and leave your thoughts in the comment section below. My name is Rafal here with OPT and we'll see you in the next video. Clear skies.